<laughs> when was the last time anyone here saw a parade? How long has that been? A couple months now, I'm sure. Fall, we saw more of them, right? Parades, they... Uh, I want to watch a parade one day. I have this problem. I joined the marching band when I was in junior high. Spent many, many hours standing like that. And uh, I was amazed at how many parades there were. Because every parade that I could ever go to, I couldn't. Because I was marching in them. And I was always flabbergasted there could be so many parades within three hours of where we lived. I I'm not as surprised now that uh, there are as many parades, because parades are what we do, we take what we value most, we put it on a float and have it throw candy at us, and that's what a parade is, right? We, we put our, what we hold up in our culture, uh, is the center of our culture on parades. And they have been around for a while. What's the oldest parade in America? Anyone want to make a stab at it? 1920, right? 1920, the 6 ABC Dunkin' Donuts Thanksgiving Day Parade. You gotta just love the way that marketing has changed what we call things. The Dunkin' Donuts Thanksgiving Day Parade, 1920. There were parades far before that, though. That's just the longest running one in America. If you want to get into really old parades, you can go back to, no surprise, Rome, right? They had circuses, so what else do they have to entertain people? Well, they would, they would take a stadium and they would fill up the inner area of the stadium and they would have uh, naval battles, it, like full naval battles in these stadiums. They just did mass spectacles for crowds all the time. And they would also do parades. The uh, parade the Romans would do, they didn't call it a parade, they called it a triumph. And uh, it was given, no surprise, to journals who triumphed in battle. For the first centuries of, of Rome, it was a republic, uh, it was the Senate would vote to give a general a triumph and he would enter the city with, in the front of his armies. And we would have the, uh, the, this triumph. It did change about the first century BC and by the time of Jesus, by the time of the disciples, by the time of the church, it had changed. It was no longer, a triumph was no longer something given by the Senate to the Roman general who had defended the, or the empire. It was uh, an emperor giving it to himself because he was so cool. But that's what it changed into. If you were an emperor and you thought you'd done something impressive, you would give yourself a triumph. You would march the troops through the city. You would put all the leaders of the foreign nations You'd chain them and make them march behind in subjugation. You'd have all the spoils of war. I don't think they threw any candy. And uh, at the end of the triumph, the emperor would take on a new name. And so Caesar, who, the Caesar who conquered Brit, uh, Germany became uh, Germanicus Caesar. He got a new first name. The guy who had conquered uh, Britain, Tiberius, he becomes Tiberius Britannicus. He gets a new last name, and I have no clue why they put them where they did. It's, it, I don't understand. But that was the parade of the time, right? The, the triumph. We have a parade, and we have big old balloons of SpongeBob, and marching bands, and Romans had war horses, and uh, spoils of war, and conquered leaders. So this is the setting into which Jesus leads this parade in Jerusalem. If we think of what are we, how are we going to do a parade, we think of the parades we know of, the Macy's Day Parade, Thanksgiving Parades, etc. It, when, in Jesus' day, if he wanted to think about how he was going to do a parade, it was the Roman triumph. War horses, legions, conquering, right? And so he has his own parade. He does it a bit differently, though. He sends his disciples to go get him, get him a ride. And what does he get? He gets a donkey. He does not get a war horse, right? That's the ex expectation. If you're going to have a triumph in the first century, it'd be like at, today if you're going to have a, a, a parade, you want to know who has the convertibles, right? In the same way, in the first century, you want to have a parade, who has the war horses? Except that's not what Jesus goes for. The modern analogy might be instead of going for a tank, he gets a bike. And he's going to lead his parade in on, on this bike, on this donkey, the, the most humble, low-key thing that can be found. And so this parade happens, and Jesus is surrounded by his disciples, and all the crowd is gathering around it. And, and it becomes a uh, parade done in his way, 
as he heads towards Passover, as he begins this Holy Week, he is not using a war horse, glorifying military might, using, to, using it to conquer others, to establish what is called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. Instead, he is leading it with a donkey, glorifying service, beginning the Pax Christi, the Peace of Christ, that begins not with the sword, but with the cross. Jesus' parade is not led by Rambo Jesus, but by the Prince of Peace. And the peace of Christ begins not because Jesus has the biggest sword and the best horse, but because he doesn't pick up the sword at all. If you have a sword, you're cutting people out. It not, when Jesus gathers people, all are, are welcome. No one is trampled under. And so as he begins this Holy Week, he makes it clear that when Jesus is king, there will be no coercion. There will be no coercion or violence. Right? <clears throat> this, be, this lines up with what we see in Revelation. You, you might notice, we read in Revelation a minute ago, Jesus has a sword in Revelation. Where is the sword coming from? Out of his mouth, right? If Revelation is a symbolic work, are, are there are a bunch of symbols that have meanings, um, which I hope we agree on at this point. But uh, this, if a sword comes out of someone's mouth, it doesn't mean that they are going to pull that sword out of their mouth and go to town on someone. The sword coming out of someone's mouth is the words they speak. Right? The, the words of, of Jesus are the sword that he wields. This is what Paul talks about when he talks about putting on the armor of God. You remember what the sword is? It's the word of God. And, and so the sword that Jesus wields in Revelation is his words. He, he, he will convince, he will cajole, he will do any, anything he can do with words, but he will not shed blood with it. In the end, he will judge with his words, but that it only happens in the end. Right? <clears throat> Now this all does sound good, this idea of following the Prince of Peace on a donkey, forsaking swords, forsaking bloodshed, forsaking uh, coercion to be able to join in him and this kingdom to come. This all sounds wonderful. But let's be honest, we have a really hard time doing that, don't we? We have a hard time living according to the peace of Christ. We really do. And, and why is that? One of the reasons that it's so hard to live according to the peace of Christ is it becomes clear when we look at the parade a little bit closer. Look at that parade. Who's watching the parade? Zoom out a bit. You see Jesus and he has his disciples. Who surrounds the parade? It's the crowds, right? The crowds are there. And if you see a crowd in the Gospels, it's time to run. If you see a crowd, crowds are scary. When Jesus preaches his first sermon, what do the crowds do? They try to chase him off a cliff. Right? It's his hometown. A crowd tries to chase him off a cliff. The crowd gathers when Jesus is preaching at another time. And what do they do? They try to make him a king so that he can go up and run a, uh, run a rebellion against Rome. <clears throat> the crowd gathers to see Jesus enter Jerusalem and they expect this great showdown to occur when he gets to the city. But it doesn't happen. And so the crowd fades away until they gather again. And once, What's the next time we see the crowd in the Gospels? We see them show up to choose who will live, Barabbas or Jesus. And they choose Barabbas, and then they chant crucify him when Jesus is being judged. <clears throat> so if you see the crowd in the Gospels, you run. Yeah, the crowd is scary. The crowd is scary because the crowd has a very uh, well-known tendency to figure out who them is and blame them. We see this all the time still today. If you have a group of people together, how quickly can you start talking about them? Right? Why can't we get our politics working today? Well, if they would just, you know, why, why can't we get more jobs? You know, if they would just, you know, it's them. It's their problem. Why, why can't our government get something done? Why is my hometown changing? Why can't we get, it's them. They're messing it all up. But the quickest way to get a crowd going, get them riled up, is to talk about them. It doesn't matter which of them it is, just pick someone and, and blame them. Scapegoat them. Label them with the blame. Once a, a crowd is starting to blame someone, the crowd ceases to be able to confess its own sin. It, it maintains its own innocence. It's all their fault. If we can just get rid of them, then all the problems will be solved. Right? The crowd can, you know, and even if the crowd is right, even if the crowd gathers together and says that this is what needs to happen, they're wrong because it's the attitude of the crowd. The crowd that casts people out and scapegoats them and, and, and sees others as less than themselves. Jesus never leads a crowd. If you look at the Gospels, he never leads a crowd, he leads a flock. 
He leads a flock. And in Jesus' flock, all are welcome. All are sinners who are confessing and forgiven. All the people who gather in the name of Jesus are a flock. They're not a crowd, they're a flock. It's easy to say there must be a flock, but it's hard to do because we all know the social pressure, right? When someone starts talking about them, it's really hard not to get on board, not to jump on the bandwagon. Mark Twain wrote about this in his life. Mark Twain uh, wrote about it, uh, guy out of Hannibal, you may have heard of him. Uh, he wrote, he, this is the guy who wrote about racial issues in America. And, and, and wrote publicly, and then he wrote another little scene, another little book, just a small itty bitty chapter, and he wrote about racial issues in America, but he was afraid to publish this little book until after he was dead, because he was afraid what would happen if they, they, people knew what he had written. So I'm going to read that to you today, the, the thing that Mark Twain was too scared to publish. It was a time of great and exalting excitement. The country was up in arms. The war was on, and every breast burned the holy fire of patriotism. The drums were beating, the bands playing, the toy pistols popping, the bunched firecrackers hissing and spluttering on every hand, and far down the receding and fading spread of roofs and balconies fluttered a wildness of flags flashing in the sun. It was indeed a gracious and glad time, and a half dozen and though a half dozen rash spirits ventured to disapprove of the war and cast a doubt upon its righteousness, straightway they got such a stern and angry warning that for their personal safety's sake they quickly shrank out of sight and offended no more in that way. Sunday morning came. Next day the battalions would leave for the front. The church was filled. The volunteers were there. Their young faces alight with martial dreams. Visions of the stern advance. The gathering momentum. The rushing charge. The flashing sabers. The flight of the foe. The tumult enveloping smoke. The fierce pursuit. And then the surrender. Then home from the war. Bronzed heroes welcomed, adored, submerged in golden seas of glory. With the volunteers sat their dear ones, proud, happy, and envied by the neighbors and friends who had no sons to send forth to the field of honor, there to win for flag or failing, die the noblest of noble deaths. The service proceeded. A war chapter from the Old Testament was read. The first prayer was said. It was followed by an organ burst that shook the building. And with one impulse, the house rose with glowing eyes and beating hearts and poured out that tremendous invocation. God, the all-terrible, thou who ordainest, thunder thy clarion and lightning thy sword. Then came the long prayer. None could remember the like of it for passionate pleading and moving and beautiful language. The burden of its supplication was that an ever merciful and benign father's, father of us all would watch over our noble young soldiers and aid, comfort, and encourage them in their patriotic work. Bless them. Shield them in the day of battle, in the hour of peril. Bear them in his mighty hand. Make them strong and confident, invincible in the bloody onset. Help them crush the foe. Grant to them and to their flag and country, imperishable honor and glory. An aged stranger entered and moved with slow and noiseless steps up the main aisle, his eyes fixed upon the minister, his long body clothed in a robe that reached to his feet, head bare, white hair descending in a frothy cataract to his shoulders, his seamy face unnaturally pale. With all eyes following him and wondering, he made his silent way, ascending to the preacher's side, and stood there waiting. With shut lids, the preacher, unconscious of his presence, continued his moving prayer, and at last finished it with the words, uttered in fervent appeal, Bless our arms, grant us victory, O Lord and God, Father and Protector of our land and flag. The stranger touched his arm, motioned him aside, which the startled minister did, and took his place. During some moments he surveyed the spellbound audience with solemn eyes in which burned an uncanny light. Then in a deep voice he said, I come from the throne bearing a message from Almighty God. The words smote the house with shock. If the stranger perceived it, he gave no attention. He has heard the prayer of his servant, your shepherd, and will grant it, if such be your desire, after I, his messenger, shall have explained to you its import, that is to say, its full import. For it is like unto many of the prayers of men, in that it asks for more than he who utters it is aware of, except he pause and think. God's servant and yours has prayed his prayer. Has he paused and taken thought? Is it one prayer? No, it is two. One uttered, the other not. 
Both have reached the ear of him who heareth all supplications, the spoken and the unspoken. Ponder this and keep it in mind. If you would beseech a blessing upon yourself, beware, lest without intent you invoke a curse upon your neighbor at the same time. You have heard your servant's prayer, the uttered part of it. I am commissioned by God to put into words the other part of it, the part which the pastor and also you have prayed silently. Listen. Lord, our Father, our young patriots, idols of our hearts, go forth into battle. Be thou near them, with them in spirit. We also go forth in the sweet peace of our beloved firesides to smite the foe. O Lord our God, help us tear their soldiers to bloody shreds with our shells. Help us to cover their smiling fields with the pale forms of their patriot dead. Help us to drown the thunder of the guns with the shrieks of their wounded writhing in pain. Help us to lay waste their humble homes with a hurricane of fire. Help us to wring the hearts of their unoffending widows with unavailing grief. Help us to turn them out roofless with their little children to wander unfriended in the wastes of their desolated lands in rags and hunger and thirst. Sports of the sun's flame in summer and icy winds of winter, broken in spirit, worn with travail, imploring thee for the refuge of the grave and denied it. For our sakes who adore thee, Lord, blast their hopes, blight their lives, protract their bitter pilgrimage, make heavy their steps, water their way with their tears, stain the white snow with the blood of their wounded feet. We ask it in the spirit of love of, of him who is the source of love and who is the ever faithful refuge and friend of all that are sore beset, and seek his aid with humble and contrite hearts. Amen. After a pause, he has, you have prayed it. If you still desire it, speak. It was believed afterwards that the man was a lunatic because there was no sense in what he said. Right? That's the danger of crowds. You start talking about them, you start praying, you start hoping for something, and if it's them, then you can pray for things and not realize that a blessing you're praying for yourself is a curse upon them. Jesus does not take up the sword in his parade because he will not be the crowd. He will not choose a them. Jesus died for all, not just for us, and not for them. Right? That's the name of that. That's the war prayer by Mark Twain. And the most sad part of it is right there at the beginning, where a few people speak up, but they are shushed. They were not allowed to speak. It's hard to say anything against the crowd. It's so tempting to join in, and you can feel like you're getting steamrolled to say things like, maybe we should... Maybe after 9-11, the best response was a police action, not an invasion. That was dangerous to say a few years ago. It makes me nervous just to say it right now, honestly. <laughs> I hope that we don't pray for war. I hope that we follow Jesus. I hope that we put down the sword, forsake the war horse, and choose a donkey for his parade instead. That can be hard to do. It sometimes it's hard to know where to begin because that, those are bigger issues. Let me suggest a small place to begin that you can begin tomorrow. A Jewish rabbi wanted to teach his uh, followers about this, and so he asked them, How do you know when night has ended and the day has come? How do you know? And, and some of his students said, When you can tell a dog from a cat. Nope. Another student said, When you can call, tell a tree from a vine. And the rabbi said, nope. After many such guesses, the rabbi finally told them, night has ended and day has come when you can look in the face of any person and see a brother or a sister. Until that moment comes, you live in the night. Tomorrow, someone is going to annoy you. I promise you. I hope it's not me. If it is, I'm sorry. Tomorrow or this week, someone's going to annoy or offend or you're going to hear a speech and you're going to hear someone talking about a them. There will be a crowd forming and we, we just, if they would... You have a choice. Look at the person and choose. Do you see them or do you see a brother or a sister? That's how we join Jesus' flock and follow in his parade and not join in the triumph of a altogether much more evil way of living. Amen. We come to a time when we confess how we have fallen short of that, 
and we receive God's blessing and forgiveness. Please join me as we pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. This proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now, as a forgiving and peacemaking people, I invite you to stand and offer each other signs of that peace.